everyone, and welcome to today's Barnes Takeout, your daily serving of art from the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. I'm Bill Perthes, the Bernard C. Watson Director of Adult Education, and some of the things that make the Barnes, the collection of the Barnes Foundation extraordinary extend beyond the remarkable collection of pre predominantly post-impressionist paintings that Dr. Barnes collected, but also the integration of often unexpected objects, things uh, generally considered the decorative arts, um, and perhaps top among those in terms of uh, unusual qualities is was Barnes's uh, decision to include pieces of metalwork, predominantly wrought iron, um, juxtaposed amongst the paintings, um, something that many people, confuse many people um, because, because it's so unexpected. Uh, today, I'm gonna take a moment uh, to think about the metalwork and focus on one piece in particular. Um, just to put the, uh, the inclusion of the metalwork in the development of the collection itself, I want to remind you of a few dates that the foundation was chartered in 1922 as an educational institution. It opened in 1925, but it wasn't for 11 years uh, before Barnes sort of got the bug to start collecting and incorporating pieces of metalwork into uh, what he called his ensembles, the uh, unusual arrangement of the collection. So in 1936, Dr. Barnes wrote a letter to Kenneth Clark, who was the director of the National Gallery in London, where he states, quote, I, be I believe I'm on my way to show in such a fashion that every sensitive person can see that there is essential aesthetic difference. There is no essential aesthetic difference between the forms of the great painters or sculptors and those of the iron workers of several hundred years ago who made such commonplace objects as hinges, door handles, locks, etc. To make the job complete, I'm en route to Paris to get some more uh, early French pieces of hardware and if possible, get some English pieces too. So in, it was in 1936 that Dr. Barnes first started to incorporate uh, metalwork, predominantly wrought iron pieces, into the ensembles. Um, so uh, many of the objects that we have are commonplace hinges or poles or plate escutcheons, lock plate escutcheons. Um, but the piece I'd like to focus on today is a truly exceptional piece in the collection. And we see it here second to top in uh, gallery six. We're facing, we're facing south. And a bit of a personal note, when I brought my young children to the, to the collection, my son, who was uh, less than seven, uh, immediately was attracted to this piece and uh, asked, uh, what, what sort of lock would that key be used for. And this is the object that drew his attention. And not surprisingly, so just to put it back in context, it's this piece here. And here's the piece itself. So it's a very large, uh, a very large key for sure. Um, but it wasn't intended to be used as a key per se, but instead uh, was a, a sign uh, that would have hung outside a locksmith's. It's um, French, it's from the 18th or early 19th century. And the intention, there are several intentions uh, for the locksmith to hang this out front, first of all, to signal his trade, uh, but also to demonstrate the, the skill, his craftsmanship. Uh, by the very ornate quality and intricacy of, of this object. Now, it would have hung uh, vertically, although in the ensemble, Dr. Barnes hangs it horizontally, and you'll see at the tip this uh, round opening, and that's where it would have been suspended from a bracket out front of the, the locksmith shop. 
Um, this is an object that is invested with aesthetic qualities, qualities that were intended to make it a visually um, exciting piece uh, to look at. So beyond practical uh, purposes, but really invested with uh, creative or artistic qualities. Um, some of which um, likely would have had some um, symbolic connotations. Uh, we don't know who made this. Uh, works like this were not uh, were not regularly signed. Um, and even the dating, as I said, it's from the 18th uh, to early 19th century, is challenging, somewhat challenging to determine uh, because the material itself uh, doesn't really show the age. We can't date it per se. Um, and styles were often uh, replicated or even in later years when old pieces were uh, repaired because of wear or damage, um, craftsmen were able to replicate those earlier forms, often to the degree that it was, it's almost impossible to tell what was a, a more modern or a repair to what was the, the original. That said, there are some, certainly some remarkable aspects uh, to, this, uh, to this object. At the, at the key end, we see this box. This is uh, this would have been hollow, and it's decorated is hollow, and it's decorated with this floral design, um, which uh, is, is a is a quadrifoil, so four um, four leaves, the, and this is a symbol that goes back in time. Uh, think of it as the four leaf clover, and its uh, intention is as a sign of good luck. Um, the shaft of the key is, you'll see, replicates um, rods um, that have been bound together. And I suspect that's what this top is. This is the sort of curled end of those rods. And the collars suggest the, the binding that holds them together. As we move up, here we see really some of the truly extraordinary qualities um, of the of this sign. Um, we have these these leaf designs. So these would have been made out of uh, likely sheets of of metal that were uh, shaped on an anvil uh, in and it's something that we see in smaller objects. We see them on on gates or on grills um, and in a smaller piece, Sometimes it, they could have been full, uh, formed out of a mold, but given the size of these, they likely would have been done by hand. And the variation on them, you see how like these openings, for instance, are different on each side, uh, just slight difference, and that suggests the hand-wrought nature of it. We have, um, and I should also say that these these leaf motifs, again, are an ancient one. It's, a, it's one that resonates with the palmette um, motif that we see in ancient Egypt, for instance. Um, so it's one that very much resonates through through time. In the French tradition, uh, the leaf design is one that changes in its uh, level of ornateness uh, depending on the period. From and here, you know, we're talking about Louis the Thirteenth, Fourteenth in those periods. Uh, in the center, between these uh, leaf motifs, we have these three. Uh, interlocking circles. They might reference the Christian Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, although uh, more often than not, those three are directly interwoven. So the third would actually have been down here. So it, or it may just have been a choice to uh, include three interlocking circles. And then within that, we have these C curls or scrolls and you'll see that there's an abundance of those, both in the back, just tucked in beneath uh, and behind the leaf motif, um, and then varying from the center to the edges, and then a flourish of them on the outside. We zoom in a little closer, we can get a sense of the piece's construction. 
So, for instance, if we look up underneath, because we can look underneath these leaf motifs, we can see that that's the, these uh, pieces are open, so they're not solid. Um, and as I mentioned, the scrolls are tucked in under underneath that. If we look down here, we can see the tips of each of the leaf pieces that have either been welded together. There might be a a bolt that holds them together that this collar hides, or it could be that the the piece is held together by the, the collar itself. Um, and you'll notice that each of these pieces, these scrolled pieces, is a separate piece, even though they look like, and this was certainly the, uh, the craftsman's intention, that they seem to arise out of a single, a single piece. Um, and as we move up, we can see, for instance, here where this rod pierces underneath this knob. So that's a, a bolt that would have held, that holds the pieces together. We get the, the illusion that these are interlocked, which they probably are um, likely welded together, um, which gives them a lightness. But if we look just underneath, there's another bolt holding these uh, these separate pieces together. And if we go to the top, we get the echo of what we saw down below. And again, notice the tips here where these pieces join each other. So it's quite a quite an ornate piece. Um, uh, and it's certainly a piece of metalwork that stands out in the collection, both because of its scale as well as because of its delicate yet uh, delicate and ornate quality. So it's an interesting combination of something that's large in scale, but that has a delicate, decorative, almost filigree quality to it in the abundance of scroll work. Now, if we put it back into the context of the ensemble, we might ask the question, why this piece in this ensemble or on this ensemble? Um, and I suspect there's a couple reasons. Uh, the one I'll point out for us today is how it relates to the objects that are on the extreme of this ensemble, on the extreme right and extreme left. Here we have two American 18th century Windsor chairs. And you'll notice that these Windsor, Windsor chairs are of considerable scale. They're quite large. And we have a pair of them on either side. Over top of them are paintings by Pierre-Auguste Renoir from around 1917 to seated nudes. And I think the Renoirs give us a bit of a clue that Renoir has chosen to paint these large scale nudes, but that the picture itself is very delicate and decorative. So it's a combination of perhaps unexpected qualities, things that are large, but have a light, delicate decorativeness to it. So if we go back to the full ensemble, we see how we have a mirror of that on, or an echo of that on the other side. And then finally, if we look at this Pennsylvania German chest, um, again, a common kind of object in the collection, 18th century, as you can see by the date on it. It itself, again, is a large, solid, um, sort of massive uh, chest, chest uh, over drawers, uh, but that it is has been decorated or was decorated with uh, these undulating vertical uh, lines that give it a, a decorative delicacy. Um, so again, resonating with the qualities both of our uh, locksmith sign, as well as the Renoirs and the American Windsor chairs on either extreme. Um, so I hope that the next time you visit the collection or if you visit it online, um, take some time to look at the at the metalwork, the ironwork in the in the collection. As I said, some of the pieces are very common and simple, but we do have some uh, really surprising examples of of wrought iron. Um, so I, I again, I hope you'll look for those in the collection, 
And I want to thank you for tuning in to today's edition of Barnes Takeout. Um, do subscribe, leave comments below. We enjoy hearing your reflections and additions to our observations. And join us again for the next edition of Barnes Takeout. Take care. I'm Tom Collins, Neubauer Family Executive Director of the Barnes Foundation. I hope you enjoyed Barnes Takeout. Subscribe and make sure your post notifications are on to get daily servings of art. Thanks for watching and for your support of the Barnes Foundation.